All right, so um, I recently watched some of this video of this guy who goes by the Bible Sojourner, and uh, I had a little back and forth with him, and I thought that um, the back and forth exchange we had in the comments would make a good video. Um, so there's a comment that this guy made or a statement this guy makes in this video that I'm going to play here that I, f I find it interesting that he doesn't really apply what he says here in this video that I'm about to play to his discussion with me. He actually does the exact opposite and does the very thing that he encourages other people not to do. The point is that you can't take one passage meaning and just apply it on all others. That's called proof texting, um, or really source texting, because you're looking for something to support your idea, and then you're ignoring the context of all these other passages. And that's what he does to me. <laughs> I don't do that. I don't, I don't do that. I don't do that. Um, so, I'm just going to get into my comment to him. And, you know, what the video pertained to was the question, are the Israelites God's chosen people? And my thinking, or my, my view, which I would say is what Jesus taught explicitly, is that that's the incorrect question. The correct question is, who are God's chosen people, and why are God's chosen people, why are God's chosen people chosen, and for what purpose? So it's a three-part question, and there's a verse that says it. It's Luke 10, verse 22, which, what I write here is paraphrases it. And what I wrote is, it is written that God's chosen people are those whom Jesus chooses to reveal the Father to, a.k.a. Christians. And when I say Christians, I don't mean all people who claim to be Christians or go to church who, who, or, or think they believe the Bible, what the Bible says are people whom Jesus has chosen to reveal the Father to. I don't say that, I don't think that. So, like, I don't use the word Christian as this broad term that means anyone who identifies. Like, I don't, I don't, I, I don't think of the word Christian as having anything to do with identity politics. Or, like, I identify as a Christian therefore I am one. I think therefore I am. I don't, I don't, I don't think of it that way. Like, I think of what Christian means in a very different way than the majority of the church does. Um, so, I continue on saying it's a pretty self-explanatory verse. Either you believe it or you don't. It's as simple as that. So yeah, I'm saying... God's chosen people are those whom Jesus chooses to reveal the Father to, a.k.a. Christians. And the interesting thing about this is there are people who are Jewish, who have Israeli citizenship, whom Jesus has chosen to reveal the Father to, and those people are Christians. The other interesting thing is not all Israelites are Jewish. Some of them are Arabic. And of some of the Arabic ones, some of those Arabics are Muslim. So <laughs> this this kind of view of God, God in the Israelites, the pe the people of the Israel that live in the state of Israel makes this assumption that those people are all ethnic Israelites. That's not the case. 
that's not the case. Some of them are Arabic people who are Muslims and they have Israeli citizenship. So, like, I, I, just the way people approach this just does not make coherent sense. It does not make coherent sense. It just doesn't. To approach this with this thinking, oh, Israelites are a people of a particular ethnic origin that's talked about in the Bible. A lot of them presumably are, but not all of them. Some of them are Arabic Muslims. I mean, e like even the, uh, the government of Israel has Arabic people on it that are Muslims. Like, about 20%, according to, you know, what I've heard from uh, Ben Shapiro. And he, he points that out in response to people who believe that um, there's some kind of apartheid in Israel, which there isn't. If there was an apartheid, there they wouldn't have a, um, a government that was like 20%... Arabic Muslims, and they do. That's uh, apartheid would not have that happening, but that that totally negates the concept that there that Israel is an apartheid state. Um, the Bible soldier in his response to me says, "Thanks for commenting. Did you watch the video? I mean, the video is really really long. I mean, you expect me to watch a video that long? That." is just real rambly and incoherent uh no no thank you um i quote a lot of other verses where god uses the word chosen as well do you think i understood those correctly and yet yeah, i noticed that he did use a lot of other verses where paul uses the word chosen paul isn't god God isn't Paul. So for you to say that Paul using the word chosen is God using it, that's not God using it. That's Paul. Paul uses the word chosen. Huge difference between Paul and God. Uh, first one being that Paul did not create the heavens and the earth and all that are in them. God did. So, um, um, my response to him is I watched some I notice you quote Paul a lot I do not believe Paul was of God I view Paul as the wolf Jesus prophesied about in John 10 that would come to scatter his flock in Ephesus and then I Make a reference first, Revelations 2, 1 through 7, which says that, which describes Ephesus as being a church that left their first love. And who might you ask that they left their first love for? Well, that would be for Paul, to follow the doctrines and the teachings of Paul instead of the teachings of Jesus and we know that this happened because Paul had um, ministry outreach to the church in Ephesus hence the uh, epistle to the Ephesians and it also talks about um, Paul um, making ministry connections to the Ephesians in the book of Acts so we know this did happen. So that does confirm that um, that what's written in the book of Revelations, chapter 2, verse 1 through 7, is true. They did leave the teachings of Jesus, their first love, for another. And that would be Paul. Um, Paul was of the tribe of Benjamin, whose tribal animal is the wolf, as per what it says in Genesis chapter 49, when um, Jacob prophesies over all his 12 sons, a prophecy for all time 
that could be used to identify, to identify people. That's how it works. This is how this all works in, works its way into the New Testament, in being able to understand what's written in the New Testament, in fact. Um... I do not believe the road to Damascus story. In fact, Paul tells it in three different ways, all of which contradict each other like would the tall tales of a liar. After all, Jesus did call the Pharisees liars and children of the devil. Uh, John 8.44 And Paul was indeed a Pharisee. To simplify, I believe Jesus' words about the Pharisees, not the words of Pharisees, like Paul, about Jesus. Whether it's Paul, Saul, or Joe Blow from Columbus, Ohio. Paul's long-winded writings I find annoyingly self-congratulatory, very incoherent, and full of hypocrisy and self-refutation. To me, his writings read like something a left-wing nutjob college professor might write. Because they do. They, they write just really incoherent, gerbled up nonsense. Um, and the longer you listen to them, the less confused you are about what they're saying. The more confused you are about what they're saying and the more questions you have. They leave you with way more questions than answers. Always. I would encourage you to research examples of differences between Paul's teachings and what Jesus taught. There are quite a few and several where Jesus and Paul's teachings are the exact opposite of each other. You know, sometimes they're different in varying ways, and sometimes they're just the exact opposite of each other. Um... That would be because Paul was the adversary. That's what adversary means, to oppose. If you teach the exact opposite, if you are teaching the exact opposite of what Jesus taught, you're opposing him. Your teachings are adversarial. You're making Jesus out to be a false teacher, or a liar, or someone who, you know, who spreads misinformation. Um, and that would be because Paul was the adversary. Peter even called Paul the man who is my enemy or the man who is my adversary. And Jesus said, Peter is the rock on which he will build his church. So I find it funny that 99% of the churches, in quotations, Foundational teachings are from the writings of Paul. Foundational teachings are from the writings of Paul. Jesus said the foundation on which he will build his church is Peter, not Paul. And what does almost everyone who identifies as a Christian do? They act as though the foundation of the church is the teachings of Paul. And then I continue on. Did Jesus lie to us about who is being given the keys to the kingdom of heaven? Or is Paul, the Pharisee, the one who is the liar? I am trusting in Jesus' words, not Paul's, because they do not line up with the Gospels. The Gospels. The Gospels. Not the Epistles. The Gospels. The epistles do not line up with the Gospels. That's what I'm saying. The writings of Paul do not line up with the Gospels, line upon line, precept upon precept. And that's how I do interpretation. Line upon line, precept upon precept. It's about several precepts, not one verse in which I try to stuff everything into or try to beat all other verses into submission with which is what this guy in his video was saying some people do and he called that proof proof texting or or 
or whatever you try to you try to fit everything into one verse that um, you get this idea about and then if if it doesn't fit into that one verse then you just reject it or you take it out of context and that's what this guy does and I will show that um, as we go on um, I also comment I say I have some teachings on my channel as well if you'd like to consider the possibility I might know something you don't I've seen Jesus and angels how I say I learn scripture is from being taught by Jesus through dreams and visions etc I don't go to church if people think I'm pulling their leg or something that's fine what I preach is seeing God and hearing God though as a foundation not how to I preach that you need to and if you don't want to there's a darkness inside you that won't allow that desire to fill you and that darkness is unbelief unbelief that God would appear to you and speak to you if you sought him for that most don't most won't and this is what I say is the truth if you believe that God could talk to you if he wanted to, then you should try to arrange that event to happen. You should. Most people don't. Most people would be like, ah, that would never happen. That's just a far-fetched thing. It's like, well, you know, you, you miss 100% of the shots you never take. You know, you you miss 100% of the shots you never take. Um, and then he responds to me, Well, if I can be blatantly honest with you, if you reject Paul as being an apostle of God and inspired by the Holy Spirit, then... You have nothing to contribute to my understanding of God. You literally violated the most basic rule according to Scripture. Well, actually, the most basic rule according to Scripture is to love God above, or to love God with all your mind, soul, spirit, and strength, and to love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's actually the most basic rule of scripture. So this guy doesn't even know the most basic rule of scripture. He quotes something to me that's not the most basic rule of scripture. And this is what he's this is the quote he comes at me with. And it's John, first John four uh, verse six. We are from God. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this, we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. And the interesting thing about this verse is, you know, you know what this, who, the, who this verse is referring to when it says we? It's referring to prophets. So you could, you could rephrase this verse, 1 John 4, verse 6. Prophets are from God. Whoever is not from God does not listen to prophets. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. And then the next verse that he quotes, If anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that if anyone... He should acknowledge that if anyone does not recognize this. So he, he's saying here that if anyone thinks he's a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that we are from God. Whoever does not listen to us, by this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So what he's trying to do here is he's trying to ref use this verse to refer to himself. He's quoting 1 John verse 6 in a self-referential way 
to refer to himself, who is not a prophet, even though this verse, if you took it for what it means as it was written, it was referring to prophets. It wasn't referring to people who are not prophets. Prophets are from God. Who is, whoever is not from God does not listen to prophets. Yeah, like the people who listen to the Pharisees, who are not prophets. They wouldn't listen to Jesus' disciples, all of which were prophets. All of them, without exception. What is a prophet? A prophet is someone who hears the voice of Jesus and sees his form. But anyway, um, he goes on to say, if you are not letting the Bible <laughs> give you your marching orders, you are just inventing whatever you want out of your mind, and I have no interest in that. And it's like, no, I'm not. And the other thing is, like, he's imagining all these, like, do's and don'ts. And he's probably, and, and I, I know because he's, like, obsessed with quoting Paul, that he believes that he's, oh, I'm a, we're under the grace, not the law. But it's like, I find it funny that people who claim to believe in this grace message, they're always bossing people around with the Bible. That sounds like law to me. So you you definitely believe in law. You just you're you're just speaking in this incoherent, jarbled up nonsense manner, and and it's because you had your brain scrambled by the incoherent, blathering nonsense that is Paul's writings. Um, yeah. So if you are not letting the Bible, as if the Bible, if as if the Bible is a God. If you are not letting the Bible give you your marching orders, you are just inventing whatever um, you want out of your mind, and I have no interest in that. I am, however, always looking for further instruction on the Bible and how I can better learn from God's Word, meaning the Bible. I hope you will humble yourself and one day God will open your eyes to the truth. Thanks for the interaction. So he's saying that I'm blind, like blind like the Pharisees. It's like, oh, okay. You mean like, and it's like he quote. it's like he's the only one who quotes Pharisees. I don't quote Pharisees in support of Pharisees, but I'm somehow blind like the Pharisees. Okay. And the other thing is like, when people say things like, I hope you will humble yourself. So he's trying to make a distinction between himself and me, which is claiming to be humble. That's not humble. It's not humble to call yourself humble. I hope you will humble yourself one day and be like me. It's like, well, <laughs> no. No thanks, dude. Uh, thanks for the interaction. I mean, like, talk about being patronizing. I mean, I might be a lot of things. One of them isn't patronizing. And it's like, and this is another thing that's kind of like living according to rules that make you act unnatural. It's like, like, this guy, like, thinks, well, it's not about what I say. It's about how I say it. It's like, I gotta say it in the most politically correct way, and, and that there's somehow a godliness about saying everything in this very politically correct way. It's like, well, you're still being an arrogant jackass about everything. So, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I mean, is talking in the snotty. Um, patronizing, customer service type way. Is there really anything godly about that? Not really. Is there anything humble about that? No, not really. I mean, that's 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 why I don't I don't really have any desire to kick it with church people that much, because they just they're not really they don't really act authentic. They're always trying to be someone they're not. 
like I don't know it's just that's that's a waste of time to me to like spend a whole bunch of time with people that act like that you know I mean I can try to give you an opportunity to hear what I would say like once maybe twice and after that you still act the same and it it talking to you is like talking to a brick wall then I'm just like okay whatever later peace and that's it um my response to this guy wrong 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 first John 4 verse 6 refers exclusively to the prophets I already discussed this those who have heard his voice and seen his form you are not a prophet what first John Four, verse 6 means is whoever refuses to listen to those who have seen and heard God's voice or whoever refuses to listen to what those who have seen and heard God's voice says is not of God which contrasts with Matthew 10 verse 40 like the other side of a coin Matthew 10 verse 40 is a verse that says um, whoever receives the, a prophet in the name of a prophet receives a prophet's reward. What is that reward? Uh, the gift of prophecy, which would, would mean that you will uh, be having visions, divine visions, and God will show you things. He will reveal the will of the Father to you, which is you know, what it says being chosen is. It also says in Matthew 10, verse 40, whoever receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man, a righteous, a righteous man's reward will he re receive. In um, Matthew 5, in the Beatitudes, it says this, the righteous will see God. So what is the reward of the righteous? To see God. Um... Continuing on, and not just that, the fact that I won't listen to you is evidence I might be listening to God instead of you. As it is written, my sheep hear my voice and the voice of a stranger they will not follow. I don't know you. You are a stranger. And I'm... I was quoting John 10. So what he was saying is if I don't listen to what he says, I'm not of God. Because he was quoting this verse self-referentially. We are from God. So he's saying, I am from God. Whoever is not of God will not listen to me. By this, I know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So anyone who disagrees with him is not of God. And I wasn't saying that. I was saying anyone who disagrees with Jesus just disagrees with Jesus. I'm not going to sit around and say whether you're not chosen by him. Because, I mean, even um, Jesus' disciples like were puzzled by things Jesus said and doubted things he said and they were chosen by him they didn't agree with everything he said like as soon as it came, left his mouth they didn't but they heard his voice and little by little they changed their minds they were being filled with faith so, I'm not going to sit around and say that anyone who doubts what Jesus, has struggles with what Jesus said, is not of him. I'm not going to say that. But if he's not even, if he doesn't even speak to you, you're not of him. Because that verse, like I said, that verse, um, 1 John 4, 6 was written by prophets in reference to prophets. 
not written by scholars in reference to scholars. This guy's like, you know, thinking of it as, I'm a scholar and I know the the findings of of the scholarly class and if you don't agree with me as a scholar, a Bible scholar, then you're not of God. <laughs> it's like, that's that is not, the Bible does not really teach anything like that. It does uh, mention the scribes and the Pharisees who thought like that, though. Um, so, yeah. So, yeah, my, my challenge to his interpretation of that verse, 1 John 4, 6, I, I thought was a pretty good one. The fact that I'm not listening to you is at least evidence I might be listening to God instead of you. And, and obeying God, be a be, being obedient to God by refusing to listen to you. Because cause what this guy's doing is he's trying to do, he's trying to pick out a verse and make all other verses in the Bible bow to that verse. In a way that shows that the verse he quoted, he took out of context. Because how could it be true that I'm not of God because I won't listen to him, what he says, if that verse means um, I won't listen to someone who's like a Bible scholar, Bible teacher, that teaches the Bible from scholarly type um, perspective, not as opposed to someone who's been taught by God himself, someone who's prophetic and has been revealed the scriptures by Jesus and God has been revealed to them by Jesus in the same way the, the uh, twelve experience the revealing and the unveiling of God because of Jesus. I mean, I, I'm certain that this guy would not say that his Christian experience is the exact same thing as the Twelve Disciples. Like, I'm, I know this guy's not going to say that. Um, so, yeah. So, like I said, I mean, me saying that I'm not listening to you and that's actually evidence that I might be listening to God instead of you. And I didn't say that it's proof that I'm listening to God instead of you. No, I just said it might be evidence that I'm listening to God instead of you. Because as it says, my sheep will not follow the voice of a stranger that they don't know. And I don't know this guy. I don't know him from Adam. Don't know him from Adam. So... The fact that I'm not listening to him who is a stranger may just be evidence that I'm listening to God instead. Um, and then uh, um, I continue on, but this all goes back to Luke 10, verse 22, which describes whose God-chosen people are. Those whom Jesus chooses to reveal the Father to, the prophets. Then I continue on. You were not chosen. You are not a prophet. Jesus has not revealed the Father to you. You are pridefully attributing verses to yourself that do not apply to you in the way they applied to those they were written about, the prophets, when they were written. You are, in fact, twisting the scriptures to fit your lack of experience and the lack of things you have in common with the twelve disciples of Jesus. The number one thing they, the twelve disciples of Jesus, all had in common is that they all heard his voice and saw his form. The reason I put these in quotes is because those are from a verse that I'm in a quote, which is the next verse. Like, I've, I've put in quotations, heard his voice, saw his form multiple times. 
Um, continuing on, you have never heard his voice nor seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you, for you do not believe the one he sent. You study the scriptures, and this is exact, a perfect description of him, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. That's what. That's exactly a perfect description of what this guy thinks, and millions and millions and millions of people like him. They study the scriptures because in the scriptures, and in the studying of the scriptures, they think they will have eternal life. I mean, even his comment to me about, oh, you need to like, oh, the Bi go to the Bible and the Bible and obey the Bible and and follow the Bible. That's what he's saying. He's saying that I need to study the scriptures diligently because in them I will find eternal life, according to him, because that is what he thinks. Which shows that he doesn't even believe the scriptures or understand them, even though he studies them over and over and over and probably has for years and years and years. Probably many more years than I have, I, I assume. Um, these are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. John 5, verse 37 through 40. It's one of my favorite places in the Bible. It's, like, it's such an offensive verse. Because it really, really does separate the spirit of truth from the spirit of error. Uh, the spirit of error is the people who, 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 who they're... Their faith derives from going to church and reading the Bible and studying the Bible and Bible college and, and Bible seminary school and Bible small groups. And it doesn't come from having face-to-face -face encounters with with Jesus and, and hearing his voice where he pours out his spirit on them and they dream dreams and have visions and prophesy, as it says, will happen when the Holy Spirit is poured out. I mean, a lot of people talk about the Holy Spirit as if it doesn't describe the Holy Spirit as the spirit of prophecy. I will pour out my spirit in the in those days, and your young men will, um, your young men will have visions, your old men will dream dreams, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. If you're doing none of those things, I tell you the truth: the spirit, the Holy Spirit, has not been poured out on you. You, you haven't received the Holy Spirit. Because that is what the scriptures declare that the Holy Spirit is. Um, I have seen the Christ that I'm talking about. You have not. I do not believe eternal life can be had by studying the Bible apart from having heard him and seen his form. You do. Like New wine poured into an old wineskin, you cannot contain the true meaning of Jesus' words because they condemn you and exonerate his prophets, those Jesus has chosen to reveal the Father to. See how I keep revisiting the, the verse? Because yeah, I'm tying these verses together. I'm not making them... I'm not making a bunch of verses bow down to one verse. No, I'm actually showing how all these verses complement each other. And unlike him, dude, I've referred to lots of verses, and I always do this. Like, I don't, like I'm not the kind of person that will, like, quote one or two verses and then speak at great length about one or two verses. No, I'll be like quoting lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of verses. I do this all the time. Like look how many like let's see how many verses I, I refer to. One, two, three, uh four Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twenty one, twenty four.
25 and then you know the ones from Revelations 2 so 32 verses like I refer to 32 verses to to make one point Not a lot of preachers refer to as many verses as often as I do. As often as I do. Like, I refer to a lot of ver Bible verses when I preach. A lot. That's why I think it's funny when people, like, 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 d don't even uh, consider for a moment that I know, that I know, know the Bible. Dude, I refer to a lot of Bible verses always when I preach. Always. Like, I don't just refer to a couple and then talk for, like, three hours. Like, I refer to a lot of Bible verses. Like, routinely. <laughs> a lot. Like, I'm always quoting lots and lots and lots of Bible verses when I preach. And I don't go in a million different directions either. I mean, it's at least something to consider. I'm not going in a million different directions, but I am quoting a lot of Bible verses. Um, or referring to a lot of Bible verses, at least. Um, uh, you are like a... You're uh, like new wine poured into an old wine skin. You cannot contain the true meaning of Jesus' words. I mean, the, uh, I, I, I can't remember where that is in the Bible where Jesus refers to new wine poured into an old wine skin because that's what it's about. It's someone who's not able to contain the gospel. It won't, it, can, it can't remain in them, you know. There's something about them that just can't receive it. They're, they're, they have this, there's this condition that they're in, this mental state that they're in, where they can't receive new wine. Because they're like an old wine skin. Just, it'll, it'll just cause the skin to burst and the wine just to pour all over. And then, uh... I referred to Luke 10:22 as those who Jesus chooses to reveal the Father to, and also Revelation 19:10, which says that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, which means they're the same thing. So, in order to have the testimony of Jesus, that would mean that you have the spirit of prophecy means the spirit that reveals prophetic things to you you know allowing you to speak prophetically at like a prophet <laughs> it's it's and it's and it literally says in revelations 19 that those are the people who have the testimony you know like the people who know the testimony of Jesus who can preach with knowledge of what they're talking about. I mean, what a preacher is, allegedly, is someone who, that knows the testimony of Jesus. But the testimony of Jesus is that the only people that know the testimony of Jesus are those of the spirit of prophecy. Revelations 19.10. So, I mean, that really makes a distinction who actually Christ, real Christians are. And then I also refer to Isaiah 30, verses 20, verse 20. It says that uh, your teacher will be hidden from you no longer. You will hear a voice speaking from behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. And then I go on to say, and yes, I do acknowledge that those who will not listen to God's prophets are not of God. And then I refer to 1 Corinthians 14, 37 and 38. And which is, you know, the verse that says, well, if you claim to be spiritual, at least you can acknowledge this. 
that those who won't listen to us, meaning the prophets, are not of God. And it's like, yeah, I do acknowledge that. The person who doesn't acknowledge that happens to be you, not me. And then I write, ironically, Paul would not listen to Peter or John. Galatians 21 or Galatians 2, verse 11 through 21, and Acts 15, 36 through 39. And I'll go to those. First I'll go to Acts 15. Um, I'll go to the part about John first. Listen to this. Listen to how Paul treated John the Beloved. John the Beloved, the most beloved disciple of Jesus, whom Jesus said, What business of it is yours if this one remains and does not die until I return? What business is it of, of yours? This is the disciple they tried to boil in, in oil. To kill him, and they could not kill him. They tried to murder him, and miracles and miracles would happen that prevented them from being able to kill John. They tried to boil him in oil, and they could not kill him. Um, some time later, John the Revelator that wrote the book of Revelations, this is how Paul treated him. Some time later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit sometime later Paul said to Barnabas let's go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they are doing Barnabas wanted to take John also called Mark with them but Paul did not think it wise to take him because he deserted them in Pamphylia and did not continue with them in their in the work yeah, because he he, he kind of had problems with Paul. He's like, yeah, this, is, this guy is a bunch. Of, like, I, no, I, I, I'm not. I'm not getting down with this guy. Um, and then ba Barnabas and Paul had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. So guess what Barnabas did? He ditched Paul. Like John ditched Paul. He's like, eh, screw you. I don't want nothing to do with you. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas. Jesus didn't choose Silas. Paul chose him and left. Commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord. And, and the thing about this, this I find interesting is that Paul talks about this event, this whole event, as having happened in Antioch, which is in Turkey. And in Acts 15, it says it happened in Jerusalem, not Turkey. So who's, who's telling the truth? The author of the book of Acts or Paul, the author of Galatians? And here's the other part where there's there's a total diversion in story. Paul in Galatians 2 describes Peter as like racist and he wouldn't sit with or or uh, um he would not sit with or treat the Gentiles like he would the Jews that he would give Jews special treatment and Gentiles they would kind of treat like chopped liver and and supposedly supposedly Paul like stood up to Peter and put tried to put him in his place for being discriminatory or racist against Gentiles that is not true that is not what happened that's that's what Paul the liar Pharisee describes in Galatians 2. But if you look at the actual, the event that it it's written happened in Jerusalem, not Antioch. 
um, you hear something very different happen. And, and you hear an attitude coming from Peter that's very, very different than how he was described by Paul in Galatians 2. Paul's such a liar. Um, so, what it says is, some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the laws of Moses. And the interesting thing is, you know what Paul says? That, that, uh, um, that Peter was bossing the Gentiles around and telling them to keep the laws of Moses, but he was treating them like chopped liver, and he wouldn't even like associate with them or sit with them. That he would only treat Jews well, and he would treat the Gentiles like outsiders, but he would try to force them to obey the laws of Moses. So, so Paul the Pharisee is trying to accuse Peter of doing what the Pharisees were being described as doing in the book of Acts chapter 15. What a liar. Um, the apostles and elders met to consider this question after much discussion. So the apostles, one of them being Peter, met to consider this question, and after what question? This question. The question of of whether the whether the, what the Pharisees were saying was legitimate. Peter got up and addressed them, Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them, who the Gentiles, by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did us. He did not discriminate between us and them. For he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. Now look at what it says in Galatians 2. What what? Paul wrote, When Cephas, Peter, also known as Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face. Huge difference. It says that it says that that this event happened in Jerusalem and some of the people from Antioch were there where when it happened. So it was people that came from Antioch to Jerusalem where this event occurred. It didn't occur in Antioch. But what does Paul say? That it happened in Antioch. When Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For certain men came from James. He used to eat with the Gentiles, but when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The, the other Jews joined him in this hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. So he was trying to say that Barnas, Barnabas, he had a falling out with Barnabas because of Peter. When in fact it says in Acts 15 that Barnabas had a falling out with Paul because Paul was trying to get Barnabas to disown John. So he is a liar. He's a total liar. He totally twists everything that, ha that happens and turns it into a total different version of the story. Where it happened, what happened, he lies about everything. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, You are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? 
Acts 15 says that's what the Pharisees were doing. The Pharisees were trying to force the Gentiles to follow Jewish customs, yet they were also treating them like chopped liver. And you know who stood up for the you know who stood up for the Gentiles? Peter, not Paul. Paul is such a liar. Like he he not only lies about Peter, lies about Barnabas, but he actually takes credit for the good deeds of Peter. <laughs> um so yeah. Paul liar. Total liar. Um, and then I go on to say, if you knew the Bible as well as you think you do, you'd already know, or you'd already know that he wouldn't referring to that Paul would not listen to Peter or John. He wouldn't. So what what is what does this guy declare that those who will not listen to us are not of God. Paul wouldn't listen to Peter or John. So according to the verse that's written in 1 John 4 verse 6, Paul's not of God because he won't listen to Peter or John. And even Paul's own writings condemn him in that regard. Um, so, you know, as it says in the scriptures, you'll be judged by your own, your own standards. By the measure you measure, you will be measured. By your own judgments, you will be judged. Um... Uh, if you knew the Bible as well as you think you do, you'd already know that Paul wouldn't listen to Peter or John. By the way, Paul's account in Galatians 2 about his dispute with Peter contradicts Acts 15. Peter said that God does not discriminate between Jew and Gentile, and he told people not to discriminate. In Paul's own writings... Galatians 2, he accuses Peter of being discriminatory towards Gentiles, which proves that Paul is a liar like his father, the devil. Acts 15 and Galatians 2 alone prove Paul hated Jesus' disciples and would not listen to them, and that, much to the contrary, Paul would slander them and try to turn their allies against them like he turned Silas against John and like he tried to turn like he tried and failed to turn Barnabas against John John who wrote the book of revelations on the island of Patmos it is simply not possible to agree with Paul Peter and John's versions of Jesus all at the same time you either have to go with Peter and John's Jesus or Paul's. Jesus founded his church on the authority he gave to Peter. Matthew 16 verse 18, which is the verse that says, On this rock I build my, will build my church. And he was referring to Peter, Cephas. And he said, On this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. If you want to believe the lies of a Pharisee, that's all on you, dude. I choose to believe what Jesus said about the Pharisees is true. So, yeah. This guy is just not really that... I mean, he might be compelling to other people. Not to me. I mean, I think he's just all over the place and really a disorganized, unlearned person. <laughs> like, I don't, like, I'm just, I mean, I, I've i done this with people online a bunch of times. I mean, it's not really, I'm not breaking a sweat. It comes pretty easy for me. 
but you know anyhow yeah I mean I mean for this guy to tell me well if I, you don't agree with Paul well Paul doesn't agree with Peter so, like, how, how can I agree with both Paul and Peter when Paul doesn't agree with Peter? How can I agree with both Paul and John when Paul doesn't agree with John? When Paul, like, tried to turn people against John because he doesn't agree with John. I mean, give me a break. I mean, this guy d does not even acknowledge that the scriptures explicitly show that there was not unity among all those that the modern-day church thinks of as apostles. Paul was at odds with a lot of people and would wholesale reject them and then start acting like, ah, oh, you, you've left the faith because you don't agree with me. And guess what this person does? Same thing. He's like, ah, oh, you, you're not part of the faith because you don't agree with me. It's like, okay, well, no, it's, in, in what are they doing? They're acting like Paul is the foundation of the church. That's not what Jesus said. So who are they disagreeing with? They're disagreeing with Jesus when they're saying these things. And, and they don't think that's what they're doing because when they read the words of Paul, they think that it's God talking. It's like, well, maybe you should compare the epistles to the Gospels because the Gospels and the epistles do not confirm each other. They oppose each other, like blatantly oppose each other in many, many, many places. I mean, I, I could do, I could talk for probably hours about this subject how Paul uh, how oppositional Paul was to Jesus and what Jesus taught I mean there's a lot of things the, this is just a thing this is just a example or you know I gave a few but yeah <laughs>